Scripture reading for today is Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And this, of course, comes from the Apostle Paul, who wrote this long, long letter to the ch uh, church in Rome. Chapter 13 of Romans, verses 1 and 2, says the following. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. <clears throat> For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. My sermon title for this morning, if you look on the screen, is Submission to God, and it's crossed out, and it says government. That's a provocative title, is it? Isn't it? Okay, I want to invite you to kneel with me, and we will pray at this moment. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for um, giving us this blessed day, this Sabbath day. We come with grateful hearts, hearts that are warmed by your love, by your presence, by your provisions, because we know by faith, God, that you are watching over us. We know by faith and we believe that we not only have a purpose for this life, but God, that we have a bright future. We have a destiny that has been written permanently in the pages of Scripture, of our home in heaven, of that glorious mansion, to live with you face to face in a perfect and sinless and gorgeously, lavishly beautiful world. Oh God, we thank you for these rich and great promises that we can personalize and internalize for ourselves. <clears throat> God, we come to you saying thank you for our children, my son, for his improved health, for operations, little Emily, that have uh, been successful. We thank you, God, for families that are together. We thank you for fathers. I think of Juliet's father. We thank you, Lord, for um, your daily blessings that you give to us, as uh, the Guzman family had, had mentioned. So many reasons to be thankful, God. There are also reasons, God, that we want to uh, express to you and bring to you in the form of requests, our petitions. You told us, God, to make our petitions known to you. And therefore, Lord, as a church family spread all over this valley and in different states we, and in different countries, like as, as such in Mexico, we come to you, Lord, praying that you will bless those who are graduating. We pray that you will bless those that are recovering. We pray for John Baker, that you will heal his body and that you will stay this COVID-19 from his body, Lord. Please protect him and heal him. We pray, God, for um, our members of our church that have requested um, a blessing over their children. We thank you for birthdays, Lord. We pray that you will continue to be with uh, Kathy Elliott and Caitlin and my own two sisters, that you will continue to bless them and give them many more years of life. Father, we pray that as churches and businesses are being reopened, not only here in Arizona, but across the world, we pray, God, that the virus will slow down we pray for those people who have lost loved ones. We pray, God, that you will help us to be wise in our exercise of reopening. It is so good to come together in person, but we understand, Lord, that there are certain measures we need to take. So help us to be wise, but also help us to be trusting and to not be panicking or angry or bitter, but help us, Lord, to... Uh, come together to cooperate and to be wise, Lord, in, in, um, from here on forward. We ask for your blessing on our service. We ask for your blessing on those who are listening. I pray that your word will penetrate not only ears, but that we will all listen and 
take these things to heart of what your word says. Bless me now, Lord, as an imperfect speaker. I pray that your spirit will use me today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, I'm going to go back to that text on the screen. Wrong way, excuse me. This is what happens when you press the wrong button. Okay, let's go back to that. Uh, if you can look at the screen with me. Scripture reading is uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. <clears throat> For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. I have, been, I have read this text over and over this week, and the reason I'll just share with you why I am uh, chosen this text for uh, today's message is because this should be no surprise to us that forever ever in the history of mankind and all over the globe there have been uh, individuals and groups and societies that have loved their governments and also there have been those that have uh, protested and opposed their governments. Um, just this week, in fact, I'm sure you've seen it yourself on television, um, there have been those people for the last no, a few weeks or so that have been protesting in front of the capitals of their respective states with signs saying reopen, uh, that the whole pandemic is a farce, that uh, it's fake, and protesting governments and government uh, leaders to reopen businesses. Now, there are many reasons for that. Uh, obviously, one is economic. Uh, people need to go back to work. Uh, businesses need to make money, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that we have all seen these video clips where um, people, at least in this country, are protesting um, because of uh, decisions that local governments have made. What the Apostle Paul is saying here is that every person is to be in subjection to the government. Now, before um, going over uh, the, what I want to cover for this morning, let me just share what the points are in this text, what the Apostle Paul is saying. Um, and I'm basically repeating it, but just rewording uh, a little bit here and there. Number one, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. Now, because Paul wrote this letter called what we call Romans, he wrote it to the Christian believers in Rome. They could be Gentile believers. They could be Jewish believers, but they were all Christians. Um, well, obviously, this includes Christians because he is addressing them. So it is these Christians that are to be subject to governing authorities. The other thing, another point, is that existing in this passage, existing authorities are instituted by God. That's what it says. That's what he is saying. Another point he says, he covers, is that resisting government authorities is resisting what God had set up. Um, that's what he says. If you have your Bibles, um, this is what he's saying in those verses, in those two verses. Another point, governing authorities or rulers exist to keep order. They exist to keep order. Uh, the next point I have is that to do good, you will receive approval, but to do evil, you will incur punishment. That's very clear. Governing authorities are servants of God. That's what, the, that's what Paul is saying. And a couple of more points regarding these uh, two verses. Subjection for the sake of conscience, um, or we should not be uh, subject to governing authorities um, just to avoid punishment, but for the sake of conscience. That's what he says. In fact, um, he doesn't say it here, but he says it a little after, in verses, verse 3 or 4, somewhere around there. Um, and then, in fact, let me read this because um, I just, these last two points that I'm mentioning, I didn't put on the screen. So this is what he says here. 
uh, Romans chapter 13. He says, um, verse 5, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. That was my second to last point. And he also says, for because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, etc. So what Paul is saying here is that taxes need to be paid and that authorities are ministers of a God attending to this very thing to make sure that taxes are paid. We all know why we pay taxes. That is to fund uh, public works, public utilities, buildings, uh, um, uh, service people, etc., etc. It was no different back in the time of Paul. Now, I wish I could hear your response to this question. What do you think? What do you think of what Paul is saying to the uh, Christians in Rome to be subject to God? That's why I entitled the sermon, Submission to God, Slash Out God, Government. I'm not, of course, intimating that we should not submit to God. It's just for the purposes uh, of this title. So what do you think? I want to invite you to do something unique that I didn't do in previous sermons. I want you to text me what you think of this passage. But please, it's not an opportunity to get on your soapbox and preach. Just tell me what you think. I'm going to take out my phone right now. And I'll say a few things about, uh, about Rome itself. But tell me what you think, what Paul is saying here. I'm not going to explain this passage immediately because I'm going to give you time to text me. But what do you think about this? Paying taxes, uh, doing good uh, to please the rulers, uh, the emperor, the king, um, avoid evil, um, being subject to the governing authorities. God had set them up, etc., this is a very provocative passage that may uh, provoke a mixture of feelings in you, especially when you think of good governments and bad governments. So tell me what you think. Text the number at 480-735-1867. In fact, let me put the number back on the screen. All right, so text that number <clears throat> and just tell me what you think. And very brief, please. Uh, please uh, keep it brief. And while you're doing that, um, what I like to do this morning is share with you a little bit of background of the city of Rome. Now, Paul is writing this letter uh, to the Christian believers in Rome. And so I think it would be good for us to get a little background of Roman rule during the first century. And then we're going to look at uh, some other th uh, things that are related to, the, uh, to this passage. And uh, so let me begin by here. A key issue faced by the Roman church a few years before Paul wrote his letter to them was the expulsion of uh, Jewish Christians from Rome, or at least some of its most prominent leaders, around the year 49 AD. Now Paul wrote this letter to the Roman Christians around 57 AD, he was either in Corinth or in Cancria, and his actual trip to Rome, as recorded in the book of Acts, was about two years later, about 59 or 60 AD. And so Paul was longing to go to Rome. In fact, he never really went to Rome in the sense of visiting the church. He ended up going to Rome and under house arrest, and people could visit him. Um, but, uh, and, and in Paul, Paul, there's, um, there's absolutely no... Um, evidence that Paul even started the church in Rome. So it must have been started by somebody else, maybe Priscilla and Aquila, we don't know. Uh, but Paul wrote the letter around 59, or excuse me, he wrote the letter around 57 AD. Um, so anyways, um, some of the Jewish Christians were uh, exposed um, from Rome. Uh, according to Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, Paul met a man named Aquila in Corinth, um, and his wife was Priscilla. They had recently arrived from Italy because the emperor Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Claudius reigned from about 41 to 54 AD, and this is written in the book of Acts. And so Priscilla and Aquila had to leave Rome, and Paul meets them up in Corinth. In his early rule, the emperor Claudius issued edicts favoring the Jews, 
and permitting them to freely observe their own laws and customs. But later, around the year 49, he expelled them from Rome. I just mentioned that. The historian Suetonius recorded this event, this expulsion from Rome, attributing their expulsion because, and I quote, the Jews' continual tumults instigated by Christus, which is a common misspelling of the name Christ. So if Christus does refer to Christ, then the riots were obviously uh, about Christ. They weren't uh, led by Christ, obviously, but they were about him, and so he expelled them. Let me talk a little bit about Roman law. So you, I'm saying this so that we can all get a picture what Paul is saying in this text. What kind of government was Rome? That's the purpose why I'm sharing this information uh, with you. So listen and follow along. Um, Roman law could be brutal. It was always relentless, but it still operated over a comparatively limited area of human conduct. Roman law tended to sleep unless infractions came out in case there were riots, etc. And then, of course, Roman law will just raise its big, awesome head and just squash any rebellions or any riots or, or anything that was of an illegal nature as far as gatherings are concerned. And then, of course, then it would sleep again. As long as people behave themselves, then you were safe from the law. But within Roman rule, a sensible and circumspect man, however uh, his views were against laws, against Roman laws, um, that individual could survive and flourish and even propagate his views as long as he wouldn't incite rebellion against the empire. And so um, Rome was uh, fairly tolerant of, uh, of the peoples that they ruled over in all of their provinces. Some of uh, Rome's laws involved taxing the populace, of course, we all know that. Provincial agriculture was taxed, um, and part of the grain was sent to Rome to feed the masses. To keep the urban commoners quiet, however, the emperor put on various spectacles, including the gladiatorial fights and wild beast hunts in which some Christians uh, even met their end, being hunted by beasts, etc. And uh, so obviously the Romans had to tax people and, and even on the agriculture. I read a statistic where tons and tons of grain would be, sh would be shipped uh, to Rome to feed the masses. Uh, what about the relationship with the Jews? Um, I've even said this before, and you've heard it before, how the Jews absolutely hated the Roman occupation in uh, southern Palestine in Judea. Um, they were not happy that the Romans were there. They wanted them ousted. And by the time Jesus comes along, and the, for even earlier, but when Jesus is uh, treading on, on uh, Roman provincial soil, um, the Jews believe that a Messiah to come would oust the Romans, would destroy the government, would get rid of the Roman government and set up his own earthly Davidic holy, righteous kingdom on earth. That's what most Jews had thought by the time Jesus was on the scene, which is why you understand now why many were so sorely disappointed in Jesus, because he did not meet their political and their messianical expectations. But um, uh, in the early decades under Herod the Great, who ruled from 37 to, uh, uh, to uh, from 4 B.C. to 7 B.C., Rome's relation, uh, excuse me, from 4 B.C., 37 to 4 B.C., Rome's relationship with the Jews was very fruitful. The empire gave the Jews equity uh, or equality of economic opportunity and freedom of movements for goods and persons. In Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great as we know him, the Jews had a great and powerful patron because although he was suspect in many Jewish minds, um, and was not recognized as a Jew at all, he was unquestionably generous to them. In Jerusalem, he rebuilt the temple on twice the scale of Solomon's temple. Within the Roman system, the Jews were very, very privileged. They could meet to hold religious services, community dinners and feasts, and every kind of social uh, gathering for any charitable purpose. The Romans were very, very tolerant of the Jews, um, in fact, they seem to favor them to a certain degree over other uh, races. They recognize the strength of Jewish religious feelings um, by, in effect, exempting them from observance of the state religion. In place of emperor worship, the Jews were allowed to show their respect for the state by offering sacrifices on the emperor's behalf. 
In fact, you see some of this even um, when Jesus would say things like, I've never found somebody with such a great faith as this man. And he was talking to a Roman centurion. You read about in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 10, where Peter is instructed by an angel to go to Caesarea to go visit a Roman centurion. And everybody talked well about this, this guy. He would help the Jews. He would build synagogues. He was just very, very charitable towards the Jews. And, um, and so it would be a mistake to say that the Romans and the Jews did not get along 100%. In fact, the Sadducees, um, we hear about the Pharisees, and the as Sadducees and the Essenes and everybody else, the Sadducees were particularly fond of Roman law and Roman order. <coughs> um, while the Jews of Judea and still more so of semi-Jews areas like Galilee tended to be poor, narrow-minded, fundamentalist, uncultured, and xenophobic, the diaspora Jews were um, expansive, they were rich, they were cosmopolitan, uh, fundamentalist, uh, excuse me, not fundamentalist, Greek-speaking, literate, and open to ideas. Now, what diaspora Jews means is the Jews that were just spread out across the world um, years before, 500, 600 years before Christ. Um, the Babylonians came, and that's when Israel officially lost their autonomy, and Jews were exiled, and they were taken captives here and there. They just spread all over the place. That's what the diaspora Jews means. All right, so that's the Romans' relationship with the Jews. I want to talk about slavery a little bit. Again, we're talking about the Roman government. I'm bringing these, uh, the Romans chapter 13, what Paul is saying about submitting to government. I'm helping you take this into context by sharing this background information with you. So I know it's a lot of information, but I want you to get the feel for the time and place and culture that Paul was writing in. Let's talk about slavery. Beneath the free population of the Roman Empire in the social hierarchy were the slaves. They were the lowest of the lowest. Slavery as an institution, it was just taken for granted. That's just the way things were. Much like uh, we would say, well, of course we have freedom of the press and freedom of, of, of speech. Um, compared to many, many countries in the world, you could say anything. You could post anything on YouTube today, and you're not going to be ostracized. You may be ostracized by friends, whoever, but you're not going to be condemned. Well, there's some exceptions, of course, but by and large, this is something that we take for granted. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom to protest. Um, it's the same way. Slavery was just taken for granted. It was just the way it was. Um, there were no serious abolitionist movements. Slaves formed a substantial proportion of the population in Italy. Some say maybe even up to one-third, um, where they were heavily involved in all aspects of economic production for the Romans. In most of the provinces of Rome, slaves were common only as domestic servants. And by law, slaves were property and could be bought or sold, beaten or tortured, at the owner's whim. This is Rome. This is the Mediterranean world back when Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. That's the kind of government that he was uh, under uh, slavery. Um, I was debating whether to say this or not, but I do want to say it because eventually somebody is thinking about slavery. Um, the New Testament doesn't actually condemn slavery outright or demand that Christian slaveholders emancipate their slaves. It's just nowhere. And this has been a problem for some people when they read the New Testament. Um, this may be due to the extreme pervasiveness of this cultural practice. It was so ingrained in political and social thinking that um, I personally believe that to protest it would have been a diversion to the overarching mission to preach the gospel of salvation to all and equality of being. That kind of message pervades and transcends all cultural paradigms. Um, so on the other hand, so on one hand, you don't read about anti, you don't have anti-slavery statements in the New Testament, and some will have a serious problem with this. In fact, I've heard debates on YouTube and how um, atheists or those against Christianity or not in favor of it or of other religions, why don't the apostles or even Jesus himself condemns uh, slavery? Um, and again, I just uh, shared my reason, I believe, for that. It would have been too much of a diversion 
whereas the gospel of salvation is the most important message for the world today, being saved in Jesus. Now, on the other hand, Paul wrote a letter to a Christian slave owner named Philemon. He was a slave owner, and he was a believer in Christ. And he had a disloyal slave named Onesimus. Now, Onesimus became a believer, and him and Paul became really close friends. You can read about this in the book of Philemon in the New Testament. But Paul encouraged Onesimus to go back, but armed with a letter that Paul wrote to Philemon, wherein Paul encourages Philemon to receive him, and I quote, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. That's Philemon 16. So the reconciliation of a disloyal slave with his master as brothers in Christ, what Paul is doing is recasting all relationships and reflects Christ's reconciliation of all things. In fact, he wrote a letter to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 28, and he says, There is neither Jew or Greek, slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So you don't see Christ or the apostles trying to change very um, foundational of, uh, things that are really set in the culture, even if they are not good, but they preached a gospel of freedom from sin, of salvation from sin, and a reconciliation of right relationships and treating each other um, as equitable persons, as crea uh, creations of God. This is what the gospel does. Okay, what about the state religion in Rome? Rome was a home to a number of temples. Paul is writing a letter to Rome. It was home to a number of temples dedicated to the Greco-Roman gods. There was a temple of Concord, the temple of Castor, the temple of Vesta. The, last, uh, the temple of Vesta was a modest but ancient structure dedicated to the hearth goddess and served by the Vestal virgins. Um, the, the ancient center of religious, cultural, commercial, and political life was the Roman Forum and other, and other things. Um, last but not least, let me share this, and I'm going to go to these texts. Uh, regarding just society and housing and population, Rome had a population of about one million people. And although, although it boasted these amazing structures and this architecture and engineering marvels, of course, built by slaves, engineered by Romans, many of Rome's residents lived in, <clears throat> in, um, in slums, in squalor. Massive apartment buildings called insulae, which means islands in Latin. They were interspersed throughout the city, often made of concrete covered brick. Insulae usually contained five or more stories. They were sometimes flimsily built thanks to poor craftsmanship, foundations, and building materials. Who cares? This is the government of Rome. You know, we want our good stuff, our forum and our buildings and our temples and our palaces and our meeting places, but this is just for the general populace. And so apparently there wasn't too much emphasis given in good housing and designing good housing for the populace at large. Um, these uh, insulae would collapse. They would kill passers-by at times. And as a result, emperors restricted, um, um, emperors restricted how high landlords could s construct the, this insulae. In fact, they could be fire traps, and in 64 AD, a massive fire gutted three of the 14 regions of, uh, in Rome, leaving only four unscathed. So it was just, it was horrible. This housing was really messed up. I guess we could say it was the inner urban areas, probably uh, what, um, and sometimes the quality and environment of those uh, poorer inner city places. That's the type of the imagery that I'm getting in describing this. Okay, the majority of Jews in Rome were poor. Many worked on the docks by the Tiber River. Sources from the period show that Romans ridiculed some Jewish customs, especially circumcision, the Sabbath, and Jewish food laws. Many other Romans were attracted to Judaism, but the conversion of Roman women often provoked aristocratic men to criticize Judaism more harshly. There you have it. I just gave you a quick, in a nutshell, background on Rome and a little bit of their government. So Paul wrote in his time and culture, and Rome was the Mediterranean dominant power, tolerant of religious expression, especially towards the Jews. The Romans were imperialistic in their designs. They endorsed slavery. <clears throat> they had a pantheon of gods. 
and ruled by law that could be ferocious in its enforcement toward the misbehaving. The Roman provinces were taxed and Jews were hostile to their Roman occupiers in Judea. <clears throat> now, after hearing all of this, you go back to Romans 13 and Paul says, be in subjection to the government authorities. In fact, these government authorities have been set up by God. And in fact, these government authorities are looking out after the taxes, which God <clears throat> is approved by God. And this is why they were set up to pay taxes, for you to pay taxes. And you got to behave yourselves. If you don't, you should fear the emperor for good reason. If you do behave yourself, you will be approved. Therefore, submit to the authorities. This is what Paul says. So what do you think? after this is the type of government that Rome was. Let me get to your, your comments. Um, <clears throat> this is what Autumn says. God appoints our leaders so we should respect them. To a point, though, I wouldn't listen to government if they wanted us to go against God's commandments. What do you think of that statement? Thank you, Autumn. All right. And uh, let's see. Diana, this is my sister in California, she says this, these are great verses and we are to be obedient to our country's laws insofar that they do not contradict the law of God. They are there to keep order and peace. Thank you, sister. Juliet writes, I think we should obey the law of the land as long as it doesn't go against God. Of course, that doesn't mean we can't voice our opinions and try to get things changed that we believe are wrong. That's the very heart of our constitution. And uh, thank you, Juliet. Dottie says, God is in charge of all that he is. My own mother, who is watching, says this, as long as government does not conflict with Bible truth, we are to be good citizens and respecters of the governing powers, whoops, the governing powers, that we not suffer punishment from breaking government laws. And uh, this, uh, well, I'm not sh uh, this is Wanda. This is Wanda. There are things that we should protest, however, even Daniel and Joseph, etc., followed the government slash authority over them. Very good point. Uh, this comes from Joe Guzman. So we tell them, don't accept the stimulus money if you think our government is so bad. <laughs> now that's a good one. If you think the government is bad, do not accept the stimulus money. Oh boy. That's a good one, Joe, I have to admit. <laughs> and... Um, and then Julie says, we are to obey God and the laws of the land where we live. Right now, the government is asking us to do things to keep us safe uh, from illness. Very, very good comments. Very, very good comments. All right. Well, I like your comments because you are writing in the context of, uh, from what I can tell, you're writing in the context of, of, uh, obeying the government, respecting the government. Now, of course you say that because you can't go against what Paul is saying. But in the cases where government laws go against God's laws, then that's uh, sort of the breaking point where we have to say no. So that is a very, very good point. Well, um, I'll address some of these things later, but I have a, a question to ask. Um, regarding these verses, because if these points are true that I shared earlier, uh, the submission, the taxes, and behaving good, and et cetera, et cetera, um, if this is all true, does this include dictatorships and oppressive regimes? So let me read those verses again. Romans 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Those which exist are established by God. Now, I'm going to be honest, I struggle with this passage, and I still do. And here's, this is the reason why I brought out the background of Rome. Paul says that the governments that exist are established by God in verse 1, Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, uh, etc. And, um, and verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For conscience sake, he says. 
obedience to the government shouldn't just be because you're afraid that the emperor, the king, the president, the prime minister or is wielding the sword or has the keys to the, to the jail cell um, or you'll be arrested by the police. He's saying no, submission to authority should be because of your conscience, not just for fear of punishment. Nevertheless, when Paul says that no authority exists except from God and except those that are established by God, does it include dictatorships and regimes? What about yesteryear and today's leaders and governments that ruled with an iron fist? Um, Bashar al-Assad of Syria. Syria has been in a civil war since, what, 2011, I believe, uh, when the Arab Spring hit, when it started in Tunisia. Um, he's still there in power, um, backed by certain other uh, nations of this world, um, but he's still in power. The question is, does his government, is that included where it says no authority except from God exists and are established by God? What about the uh, uh, Benito Mussolini in World War II, a fascist, Adolf Hitler, of course, uh, Nicolas Maduro of Valenzuela, Valenz Valenz Venezuela, <laughs> I was saying the last name, of Venezuela, and before him, Hugo Chavez. Um, Idi Amin in the 1970s, um, in the minds of other cultures, would other cultures speak bad of certain presidents of the United States? And so this is the difficult part. Do we take this at a, a literalistic face value? Every single governing authority exi exists, chapter 13, verse 1, Romans, because they have been established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. This is where um, you can get lots of, uh, this, is, this makes good for a good debate, doesn't it, Rob? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, very excellent debate. Um, I agree with what some of these uh, comments, in fact, all of your comments had said. I'm going to check if there's any more that are coming in. I agree with all of your comments. The difficulty of this is what do we do if we live in a society under a government that is very, very oppressive and has oppressive laws? Do you obey those or do you not obey those? In Rome, some of their laws were that a slave owner, even, uh, well, we know that Christian, because of Paul's letter to Philemon, we know Paul's mindset, how the Christians who own slaves should treat them. But the law stated that you can sell another human being. This is human trafficking. You can sell a person. You can buy a person. You can beat that person if you want because they were not deemed so much as a human being or a citizen, but as property. That was the law. Those were the laws of the land. And yet Paul says this, submit to that because they exist because God established them. I'm being very, very literal in what I'm saying in order to highlight that if you take that on that very literalistic level, then uh, problems can arise. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, today's issues. We have, um, I was going to put this on the screen and I didn't put the, in fact I did. I want to show you a graph really quick. So I'm going to come down here, Rob, I'm sorry. I'm going to exit this and put this graph on here. This is very, very interesting information that I found on the internet. This is uh, regarding India, the country of India. India is the largest democracy in the world as far as land mass and population is concerned. It's the largest democracy in the world. But there are some current trends that, is, that are happening in India. The population is 1.39 billion people. Um, and in India, there's a loss uh, of autonomous status. The central government revoked Indian Kashmir's autonomous status and initiated a harsh crackdown on political rights and civil liberties. This one down here says that there's suppression of protests. Demonstrations sparked by the Citizenship Amendment Act were often harshly suppressed by authorities. There's an internet uh, shutdown, a, black, a blackout in, uh, in Indian Kashmir that began in August. Let me scroll down here to uh, further down. Um, there's a controversial citizen register. Millions of people in Assam, mainly ethnic Bengali Muslims, were rendered stateless by a new count of citizens. 
freedom of expression under threat. Journalists, academics, and others have faced harassment and intimidation when addressing politically sensitive topics. And then let me go up to this uh, um, little uh, graph here. And if you're curious, this comes from uh, Freedom in the World, their 2020 report. And this is very, very interesting, this graph here. So let's see if we can decrease this and bring it up. I'm not sure if you can, can you see that on the camera? Can everybody see that? 14 years of democratic decline. Countries with net declines in their aggregate freedom in the world score have outnumbered. So with the exception of the year 2005, um, countries in the world that are leaning more uh, democratic in nature of governance in 2005, it was 83 compared to decline of 52. But ever since 2006 all the way to 2019, countries in the world are declining in their democratic nature. You have 56 increase, 59 decrease. In 2007, 43 increase, but you have a 59 decrease. And so from all of these years, you have more decreases and uh, democracy. Each bubble represents a total number of countries that improved or declined in a given year. So these are number of, uh, of countries. In 2019, look at this, 37 to 64. Now this, to me, um, I thought it was, it was a bit uh, confusing to me. I'm not a statistician. I'm not a politician. I don't study this stuff. But I was under the assumption that since the Arab Spring, um, there was more democratic leaning um, mindsets and desires in a lot of these Muslim countries since 2011. Apparently, this seems to speak the opposite, unless I'm reading it wrong. All right, so what do we do with this passage? What do we do with this, uh, what Paul is saying uh, in here? Well, I think what Paul is saying is that uh, I want to uh, turn your eyes to your scripture in front of you or your phone. He says in verse uh, 4, meaning the government, it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And uh, then he goes into the taxes in verses 6 and verse 7. Verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So in the context of Paul talking about uh, submitting to the governing authorities and that they've been established by God, I don't believe that we can take that at a very, as I said earlier, a very literalistic sense. Let me give you an example. In 19, it was 94 in Rwanda. We all know that the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Hutis and the Tutis, or the, I can't remember the name, but there was these factioning tribes, and one tribe was killing off the other one. And it was being uh, pronounced on radio and in media uh, these cockroaches, the opposing, the opposing people, and in a hundred days, thousands, hundreds of thousands were murdered and butchered. This was something that was being promoted and endorsed. Now, does that mean, even though the government was, in, was frailed and in pieces, and there was these warlords, uh, the same thing in Somalia, government has just collapsed in many countries, and therefore it creates a vacuum and some of these warring tribes or factions, et cetera, want to take over. And uh, the same thing happened in El Salvador many, many years ago under Ronald Reagan. What do you do when the government collapses or if a government is a dictatorship in nature like Cuba was or like Venezuela is? What Paul is saying here, I believe what he is saying, is not to be, as a Christian, not to be a rebellious individual that is going to go against government and incur the wrath of the government because of your bad behavior. This may sound like a simplistic answer. There's a lot more involved in this text. But what Paul is promoting is for us to be upright and good citizens, to be respectful of the laws of the land,
knowing that governments and uh, 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 in, in force, uh, police and military are there to, in, well not military, but the police forces are there to enforce what is, what is good behavior. Now, what you wrote about is what I will call civil disobedience. When God's laws come in direct conflict with the laws of the land, this is where the law of God takes precedence and your conscience must take over. And this is what some people would call civil disobedience. And we see this example even in scriptures in the book of Acts. For example, even though it wasn't against the, um, the Roman authorities, it was against the religious authorities, the Jewish religious authorities, the apostles were being ousted and there was attempts to prevent them from preaching about Jesus Christ. This new religion, this new Messiah, which the religious leaders, the powers that be, in, 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 in religiously speaking, were opposing vehemently. And they told Peter and the apostles, do not preach in the name of this person, meaning Jesus Christ. And what was their response? This is what they said. We must obey God rather than men. Now again, it wasn't referring to Roman law, but this is the mindset, this is the attitude that they had that when certain things conflicted, their consciences needed to take over. So let me give you another example, a couple of other examples. I'm thinking of Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss was a Seventh-day Adventist uh, soldier in uh, World War II in the Army. And Desmond Doss uh, was raised to believe in the Ten Commandments, to believe in the sanctity of life. In fact, um, as a little boy, he would stare at a poster. I have this poster at home. He would stare at a poster of the Ten Commandments. And the one that says, Thou shalt not murder, there's a little picture of Cain murdering Abel. And Desmond Doss, who, who died a few years ago, he says that he would just be transfixed on that picture and it created such an impact in him that when he went to the uh, army to fight in World War II, he was what they called and what's still called a CO, a conscientious objector. He refused to carry a gun, he refused to take life, but he still wanted to serve his country. Well, the movie is out, Mel Gibson uh, produced a film, I think it was back in 2016, called Hacksaw Ridge, where it uh, highlights this, uh, this incredible man, Desmond Doss, Seventh-day Adventist soldier hero, who ended up receiving the Medal of Honor from President Truman himself. Now, this is a, 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 an example of conscientiously objecting to something that you disagree with. Another example is Mahatma Gandhi. His protest against the government was very, very peaceful. The same thing with Martin Luther King Jr. He protested against the oppression of African Americans here in the United States. And how did he protest? He didn't protest with guns. He didn't try to, um, to argue people down. He would preach his message. He would uh, have marches and he would peacefully protest against some of the laws of the land that were oppressive. These are conscientious objectors. The only thing I would add to this is that if we are going to disobey the laws of the land because God's laws take precedence in our consciences, the only thing I would say is that you need to provide tangible proof of your conscience. What do I mean by that? I may not like the tax, uh, the fact that I have to pay taxes. I may not like the fact that um, I have to uh, drive a certain speed down the highway. Um, I may not like some of the laws of my land. When I want to disobey those laws because of my conscience, I have to give very strong, reasonable arguments why I oppose it. It's not just, oh, because I don't like this. I hate paying taxes. I need the money to buy a, a new 75-inch television, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. I'm tired of this speed limit, etc. You have to provide something that is very reasonable, and I would say in the context of our church, um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a worldwide denomination, um, and there's a lot of advantages to that. One of the big advantages of the denomination 
is that you have a conglomerate of thinkers coming together and trying to work things out as far as doctrinally um, certain statements regarding certain social issues such as abortion or polygamy or uh, slavery or sex trafficking or human trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. You have the advantage of good minds coming together and trying to formulate reasons why we disagree with this in our society or we disagree with that in our society. So I would say if we are going to disobey government, you have to give good, positive, strong reasons why you're doing so. And of course, appeal to scripture, what you believe the scripture is saying your duty is. Our duty is first and foremost to God, second to the government. So I don't believe that Paul is saying, you know, we have to obey the government. It's like giving you a blank check. Um, you obey the government at whatever cost. If in Rwanda, you should be killing the, uh, the, uh, the other tribe that I can't remember their names, then go ahead and massacre them and, and kill them. No, that is against what God's law states in, in scriptures. So I would say that we have to qualify these statements that Paul is saying here. Admittedly, it is a difficult passage. But when you con are confronted with laws of the land, our duty is to God first. If they conflict, and you have to prove that they conflict, that's why I'm saying you have to give tangible proof. If they conflict with your religious conscience, with your moral conscience, your duty to God comes first. But if they do not, if you can't prove it, then like it or not, whether you like taxes or not, like it or not, our duty as Christians is to submit to the governing authorities. In the cases of dictatorships and regimes that are just very, very harsh, again, I think that's when conscientious duty uh, to morals trumps um, what the government may be doing. And I'm thinking of Syria, for example. This is a hard passage to deal with. I admit that. But um, you had some great thoughts in what you texted in, and I want to encourage you and all of us, we are to be, as Christians, the best citizens on this planet. We are to be the best citizens that governments will brag about the Christians, how the Christians respect the laws of the land, how the Christians um, are submitting to the laws of the land, how the Christians, even if they oppose some of our laws, they do so in a proper fashion, in a respectable way, using the avenues that are provided for protest, but using non-violent means, non-threatening means, which too often we see in our world today, people put their spin on things, and they will protest in ways that are not very conducive to peace, that are not very um, admirable. Uh, when Christians are going to protest, we need to do it in a way that is God-honoring, and that people will say, well, yeah, I disagree with your view as a Christian, and I don't, not, I don't agree that you're protesting, but at least you are doing so in a way that is commanding respect. That's the kind of Christians we should be uh, under our governing authorities and bring honor to God. And what Paul says here in verse 10, love does, does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Not necessarily the law in the sense of governing the laws, earthly laws, but God's law. When God's law takes the throne of our hearts, we will respect others, we will love others, we will respect their person and their property, and we will do the best we can to be the most useful citizens on this planet. And when those laws come against God's laws, as they will in the coming days, as they will, it's going to take courage, it's going to take fortitude, it's going to take um, love for God. It's going to take all you can to be able to stand up to powers that are very powerful and say, I respect you, 
I want to be a good citizen, but this is where the buck stops here. I must obey, obey God before man. That should be our motto. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this passage. It's difficult. And Lord, you know the struggles that I've went through mentally and spiritually this week. Lord, we do know that you do not encourage us to incite rebellion. You do not encourage us to be disrespectful of others, even if living under pagan rule, as Paul did in his day, or Daniel, or Joseph. Father, we thank you for the governing authorities. We pray for them, Lord. And in spite of our deep partisanship in our American society today that, Lord, I just don't remember it being this sharp and rude and ugly. In spite of that, Lord, we do pray for our nation's leaders. On, regardless of whether, which side of the aisle we sit on, red or blue, we pray for them, that you will use them, that you will guide them. We pray, Lord, that you will not only, as we say, God bless America, but that you will bless other nations in this world. And that your hand will be upon the movements and the affairs and how these nations are and where they're going. European Union, India, Russia, China, North Korea, South Korea, Vietnam, everywhere in the Americas. We pray, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will be working on the nation's leaders. And help us as Christians, Lord, that we will obey you first and foremost, foremost because we love you. Help us to love your law, not in order to be saved, but because, Lord, we are saved. Help us to live upright, respectable lives in, in men's eyes, to respect our governments, to support them. And when civil disobedience is our duty for conscience sake because of you for your namesake may we do so lord that will be honoring to you as we have seen in so many examples in this world thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name we pray amen may the lord bless you and keep you and guide you have a wonderful sabbath and we will see you next week for those of you who have been joining us on zoom i thank you Tuesday nights and Friday nights at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Tuesday nights, we are studying a book called 10 Days of Prayer. And then on Friday nights, we go over the Sabbath school lesson. So I invite you to join us. Go to TempeAdventist.com. TempeAdventist.com. And you can see how you can join us for Zoom on Tuesday and Friday nights. God bless you and have a wonderful Sabbath.